Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I do want to encourage you all, first and foremost, to take a moment to sign the pew pad. I was told this week that Rick remembered to make that announcement and that people actually did it. So I said, well, I guess I need to start incorporating that in as well. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment and signing in. If you're visiting with us, we are so glad that you are here. And uh, if you would like to share as much information as you're comfortable sharing, we would gladly receive that. Um, There are a lot of announcements, so I'm not going to read through them all. But I would encourage you to take a moment to to look through the announcement section that's in the bulletin. Um, We do have Ash Wednesday coming up in, in next week. And... Uh, there are a few other things for 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 everyone, um, different programs and events that will be happening. So it's a great way to find out how you can get plugged into some of the activities here at the church. And um, I did want to mention, though, that I believe Lula Ford is meeting this Tuesday. Is that right? Tuesday at 1030. So uh, we encourage any ladies to come and be a part of the Lula Ford Circle this coming Tuesday. But with all that in mind, friends, let us direct our hearts and mind towards God as we enter into this time of worship together. There is an insert in your bulletin, Dwelling in Beulah Land. This was Paul Ivan Skoko's favorite hymn, and yesterday was his birthday. So we are remembering Paul with dwelling in Beulah Land. Would have been 80, right? Yes. Please stay.
Let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have announced the good news through your Son, Jesus Christ. May the truth of this message move our hearts and inspire our lives so that we may glorify your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the children to gather with Miss Cassie Jo and Miss Sarah, and I believe they're going to make their way to Children's Church. Our Psalter lesson this morning comes from the 147th Psalm, that's number 859 in your hymnal. We'll read verses 1 through 11 together. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. A song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up the Jerusalem, and gathers the outcasts of Israel. The The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. For great is our God and abundant in power whose understanding is beyond measure. The Lord is up and down, and has to wait So sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. May the Lord be upon the heart of Who covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, and makes grass grow upon the hills. The Lord takes no delight in the might of a horse, nor pleasure in the strength of a runner. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. You may be seated. As we prepare our hearts for a time of prayer, are there any other, are there any uh, church concerns or prayer requests that you would like to lift up today? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know you are a God of mercy and a God of grace. And as we humbly come before you this morning, We acknowledge fully and completely that we seek those very things, your mercy and your grace. 
For Lord, no matter how hard we strive to live a life of faithfulness and righteousness, a life of obedience to you, we all fall short. For that, we are sorry, but we also seek your mercy and your grace, that which we know will cover us, that which will inspire us and give us the strength to live this life that you have put before us. Merciful God, we also give you thanks for the gift of good news that has been proclaimed by your Son, Jesus Christ. For we find ourselves living in a world that is just covered by news of all sorts. Voices coming at us from every direction. We feel the weight of all those proclamations. And in the midst of it, Lord, we have your news, which is good, delivered to us. So as we come together this morning for the purpose of seeking to praise your name, we also pray, O oh God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would empower us to live in the presence of your good news and your good news alone. For it is moving. It is a moving message, O oh God. One in which we pray that we may have the strength and courage to go with. No matter where you would lead us in this life, that we would carry your message of hope delivered to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we are your instruments, and we humbly ask, O oh God, that you would use us to your glory. And so as we gather once more, O oh God, as we open the Scriptures and as we read together, may we encounter your good news for us once more. May it move our hearts and inspire our lives. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Find the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. And now let us continue in the spirit of worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of the gospel. This morning we'll be reading from the first chapter of Mark, the 29th verse. Now as soon as Jesus and his disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, And they told him about her at once. So Jesus came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And then in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and he went out to a deserted place. And there Jesus prayed. And Simon and his companions, they hunted for Jesus. And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. And Jesus answered them. Well, let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And so we went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The good news of Jesus Christ is a moving message. The good news of Jesus Christ moves hearts and it inspires lives. The good news of Jesus Christ moves people and it moves communities from places of pain and brokenness to places of hope and wholeness. You see, the good news of Jesus Christ is neither stagnant nor complacent. Now, the good news of Jesus Christ is always flowing forward towards the realization of the kingdom of God. And it's this good news that has been gifted to us. Not just shared with us, but entrusted into our care. And as followers of Jesus Christ, We understand that we have been freed from sin. We know that we have been restored to wholeness and we realize that we are also sent forth with a purpose to go with every moving message and to share everywhere this message that Jesus Christ has gifted us with. The message is moving and so are we. At least the message is meant to moving and we are meant to be moving with it. So why then? If our hearts have been moved and our lives have been inspired by this good news, why then do we feel so stuck so often? And if we are followers of the one who delivered a a moving message, why does it feel like we're not making any progress? Am I the only one who sometimes just feels stuck in the mud? I grew up in the summers down at Edisto. If you're from Georgetown, you probably had a similar experience. We used to love to go play in the pluff mud. And one of our friends, they had a, a dock that went a long ways out to the water. And there was marsh, probably 200 yards worth of marsh. And we'd love to go get down in that pluff mud and we'd walk around. But sometimes it'd be extra muddy, extra pluffy. 
and we would just sink right on down into it and and we'd spend I don't know how many minutes trying to get someplace and we'd pull our legs out and and we felt like we got somewhere but we looked back and we said I'm I don't think we've moved anywhere at all We have a message that has been given to us a message that is a moving message And yet sometimes we just feel stuck in life. Not going anywhere. You know, the earliest days of Jesus' ministry were centered around Capernaum. Up until the point that we've read today, a few things have happened in the life of Jesus. Namely, he's called his first disciples. And after calling his first disciples, they go into the city of Capernaum. And uh, and they have commenced their ministry there. And on that first Sabbath day, Jesus goes into the synagogues and he begins to teach the people. And apparently teaches them in a way that they've not experienced before because people were astounded that he taught as one who had authority. Not just as a learned man. And then he was presented with a man who was overcome by an unclean spirit. And Jesus freed the man of the clench of that spirit that it had on his life. And from then, as we learn today, they go into the home of Simon Peter. It just so happened on that day, his mother-in-law had a fever, and Jesus took her and lifted her up. And freed her of that fever. And news spread fast. And the next thing he knew, people from all over were coming to him. He spent the rest of that afternoon into that evening tending to the needs of the people who were brought to him. All kinds of people with all kinds of needs. In today's world of of social media, we would say he went viral instantly. Like, click and subscribe. Like, immediately his popularity shot off. But while all that started to transpire, something must not sat right with Jesus. Jesus. Everything was happening so quickly. Everything was happening so fast. From our point of view, it was exactly what we would have wanted in our world of fame and prosperity. Instant success. But something wasn't right with Jesus. So in the early morning hours, he says he went back to the Deserted place. The place is solitude, but the word is actually a deserted place or a wilderness place. Similar to the wilderness that he had come out of at the time of temptation, where he then felt his call to commence his own ministry. He went back to that deserted place, that place of solitude, that place where he could reconnect with the divine, where he could reconnect with his call, where he could reconnect with his identity as the Son of Man. But the people, they were relentless. Because here was a man who could fix their needs and instantly cure them and care for them and provide for whatever it was that they wanted. A miracle man. One who spoke and acted from a place of authority. And so they started searching for him. And the disciples are aware of this. And and they're thinking like we would be thinking if we happen to come in contact with this Jesus, we've got to get him back here. So they hunted for him. They searched all over. Where had Jesus gone to? And finally they found him. He had been off praying. And they tell him exactly what is going on. Jesus, 
There are crowds of people, and they've come in search of you. And Jesus hears that and takes it in. I'm curious. What if Jesus had decided to return to Capernaum in that moment? In that moment, what if he had said, okay, let's go back. The boys got bikes for Christmas. And with this, you know, addition of new bikes, we realized that they were probably going to ride, want to ride them, right? So Jimmy and I had to have a conversation about how that was going to go down because it might surprise you, but Seville Street is not a safe place to ride a bike. And Black River Road is even worse, so. James Edwards, he's almost 11 now, and, and, and we used to walk across the street and go to the hospital area and back behind the Presbyterian Church, even in the country club estates, and we'd walk around when they would ride their bikes before, but Jenny and I had a conversation, we realized that he's starting to reach that age where we need to allow him to have a little bit of more responsibility, that we got to entrust him just a little bit more. We're not ready for him to ride through Georgetown or anything like that, but but we said, maybe we need to extend a little bit. Maybe it will be healthy for him to get a little bit more responsibility. And so he's allowed to ride his bike through country club estates. And I have to tell you, that first time that he went on his own little bike ride, and, and I watched him cross over the main road, and then he rode off, and I sat down and just kind of took it in, it was a bit hard for me. Not just because I was a parent watching my child take his first, you know, another step into his own personhood, but, but if I'm being honest with you, it wasn't just like having to deal with my child kind of gaining that. It was that I realized that I wasn't needed in the same way that I was needed before. Like I said before, I would go with him. He needed me to be with him when he rode his bike around, when he was doing, you know, whatever. And same with the twins. But now he was doing it and I was sitting there by myself. And it wasn't so much being alone in that moment. And it wasn't because I enjoy having some sense of companionship. It was in that moment of realizing that in the way I used to be, I was no longer needed. And sometimes it feels like not being needed can equate with not being worthy or not being valuable and not mattering. Sometimes it's not being alone that's the worst. Sometimes it's feeling like you are unseen or unwanted that hurts all the more. And Jesus, in that moment, he has something that I don't know, if, at least for me, and I don't know if it's for you, something that, that I struggle with, that inherent desire to know that I matter, that I am necessary in the eyes of others, that I am needed. In that moment, He's not just needed, he has an opportunity to receive all the popularity that any of us could ever hope for and a world of prosperity that could come with it. If only he went back and became the miracle man that they wanted him to be. If only he would go back and be the miracle man that they were searching for. All he had to do was go back and fill the expectation of the crowds that had gathered. And he would have had it all. I don't know if I would have had the courage to not go back. And quite honestly, I don't know if I would not have fallen to the temptation of saying, that's absolutely everything that all of us seem to search for in this life.
What if Jesus had decided to return to Capernaum? What if he had decided to be the person that the people were searching for instead of the person that God had called him to be? You see, the good news of Jesus Christ is a moving message. It moves hearts. It inspires lives. It is neither stagnant nor is it complacent. It flows forward to the realization of the kingdom of God. And in those early morning hours, Jesus sought an audience of the one. Not an audience of many, just the one. He pauses to pray and he reconnects with the one who sent him. He reconnects to the message that he was sent to proclaim. He reconnects with his identity. He had not come to seek the favor of man. Rather, he has been sent to make known the good news, to announce the coming of the kingdom of God, and to call for the repentance of the people. That's what we hear in Mark Verse 37, when the disciples found Jesus, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. And so he answered, well, then let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. Jesus has not come out to become the expectations of the people. He has come to release the kingdom of God into the world. He has come to deliver a message of good news for all the people. He could not go back to Capernaum. I mean, he could have. He could have been the person that the people expected him to be. He could have attained that popularity, but he would have been stuck. He could have attained prosperity, but at the forfeiture of progress. At least progressing the message onward. He could have become what the people sought. But in becoming what the people sought, he would have lost his own sense of self. So I ask you again, why do we feel stuck? Why does it feel Sometimes, like, we're not moving forward in life. And when we ask ourselves these questions, I think really we're getting to the heart of the matter is, do I matter in the eyes of others? Am I needed? Well, the good news of Jesus Christ is a moving message. And as recipients of this message... You and I are called to move with it. My friends, our value is not found in being the expectation of others. Rather, our privilege is carrying forth the good news that we have been blessed to receive. Our blessing is to share this good news in the unique way that God has created each of us to do. So my question is, will you move with it? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand and join me as we respond to this message by the affirmation of our faith through the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Her day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence to come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated, and as you are, you're welcome to turn to number 13 in your hymnal as we prepare ourselves for the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. For by the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Once more, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Gracious God, do pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for us that we might be made whole. This is the blood of Christ shed for us for the forgiveness of sin. As always, this is not my table, nor is this Duncan's table, nor is this the table of the Methodist Church. Rather, this is the table of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And for that reason, everyone is welcome to come to this table who earnestly repents of their sin and desires to be in relationship with God the Father through the Son. This time I'd like to invite those who will be assisting to come forward. And the ushers will be uh, bringing you all forward at the right time. You're more than welcome uh, to kneel at the altar for a time of prayer, to return to the pew for a time of prayer. But for now, come, this table is open. You can move. We're doing this through intention. You're welcome to take this piece and then just dip it in.
our closing hymn is Fill My Cup, Lord, 641. Holy Spirit, do come upon us here and now. Give us the strength to go forth this day and to live before all people the love that we have been blessed to receive through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.